Hello, and welcome to another episode of Builder Spotlight, a monthly interview with luthiers from all over, found exclusively at Acoustic.Coffee. In this episode, I'm very excited to be talking with Michael Bashkin from Fort Collins, Colorado. So grab a cup of your favorite coffee, and we'll spend a little time with Michael, getting his perspectives on building acoustic guitars. Michael. Hey Rich, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing all right. Busy day. Michael, thank you for joining us on the Builder Spotlight. I really appreciate it and it's great to have you. Let's let's begin with you. You've been building for almost 25 years and your your background's extensive in terms of understanding forestry and, and woods and species. But you know, tell me how you got started. Well, I like many people, I started playing guitar when I was a teenager. So I've always had guitar, you know, in my life from a pretty early age. I probably started playing guitar around 12 and was just really enamored with uh, with the instrument and the music that it made. And it wasn't until I was in uh, uh, working on a, a degree in forestry at Colorado State University that I bought my first nice guitar and I was having some uh, work done on it. And so I went to this uh, guy's house who fixes guitars. And I remember I walked into his room and he had guitars up on, on three of the walls and workbenches all around. A switch had flipped. And uh, all of a sudden I thought, wow, you know, you can, somebody works on these things and builds them and uh, creates the tools for musicians. And I was uh, a really exceptionally average guitarist. So I didn't, I had long ago given up my dreams of becoming a rock and roll star. And, uh, but I really liked the idea of being involved with the instrument uh, in a very hands-on way. So it was that, was that experience walking into this, uh, this guy's shop who uh, really kind of turned me on to the idea that this is something I wanted to pursue. So, and he actually later became uh, a mentor of mine and really helped me get started. So the, the question that I have is, how did, how did the repair go? Oh, it went great. It was just uh, putting a pickup in. I was playing out at uh, open mics at the time and uh, okay. just singer-songwriter stuff, and I needed some way to amplify my guitar. So uh, that, that's a really cool story, you know, um, being inspired and seeing others doing it and, and catching the bug that way. That's pretty cool. Was there a, a time, Michael, where this was um, more of a hobby for you in the beginning before it became a business? Or was it like full bore, hey, I'm going to be a guitar builder, jump right into it? Oh, no, it was not full bore because um, I had uh, no experience. I had uh, no money. Uh, I was in graduate school at the time. Um, and that process was just simply, you know, working for several years, uh, gaining experience, uh, doing basic repairs, buying tools, uh, talking to everybody who would talk to me. And I also joined an organization called the Guild of American Luthiers, uh, which is still around today, which is yeah. a great organization. And uh, it be yesterday. Yeah. All right. And I went to uh, one of their conventions and which was great. It's like a three day workshop uh, on a variety of subjects related to building and repairing guitars. And so those kinds of things really helped me get going. It certainly is different. That's why I was asking if there was, you know, experimentation or just kind of more of a hobby to begin with uh, to, to hone the craft. Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of experimentation for sure. And my first couple of guitars just went to friends and I, uh, I think I just sold them for the cost of materials. So um, tell me about guitar number one. Guitar number, number one. Yeah, guitar number one was a, uh, a, actually a kit, a Martin kit that I bought from their uh, 18, 1833 shop. Yeah, I've been there. And uh, they, the side, yeah, I think the sides are pre-bent. I can't remember, to be honest with you. Um, and some things like the neck block and the end block are, are roughed out. Um, and it's a good way to get started because they, you don't have to have a lot of woodworking equipment. And I really wanted to kind of dive in um, and, uh, and learn the process. So my first, actually, I think two guitars were kits before I started from scratch. 
my friends and I, we would go to that, that shop, the old Martin factory. Yeah. I can't remember what street it was in, but they had all the materials there that they were selling. And as a guitar player, you're like, wow, that's really cool. Check this out. Check that out. And you mm-hmm. get lost in there. So now, you know, fast forward, just, just to kind of check the box in the 25 years, about how many guitars have you commissioned or, or built? I'm uh, almost up at 200 now. That's impressive. So, yeah. 200 and thousands of, uh, of repairs as well. Um, is there a, an aspect of the process and, and either beginning or present day that you find or did find most challenging? Yeah, uh, well, the finishing process, uh, I, I have always found probably the most challenging and, and still do. It's, uh, it, it's just a, a finicky process with a lot of different, you know, solvents and chemicals and gear and the, uh, you know, the stage has been set where the market expects uh, a high gloss, uh, completely mirror flat finish. And there's several different ways to do it, but one of the things that on an, on an acoustic guitar that's important is not to have the finish very thick. And so the challenge is, is to walk that line and have as thin a finish as possible, but to also have it thick enough that you can achieve a, a high mirror gloss finish. I am struggling with that one as well. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you know it. I'm struggling you know. with that one as well. I, I tend to want to put almost no finish on it, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's it's a balance, and uh, n- now we just to dig a little bit deeper on the finish. Is there a favorite? Have you worked with many different types, or do you have a standard? Oh, uh, I do have a standard, and I have worked with uh, many many different types of finishes. Uh, but I've my standard finish is a, a nitrocellulose lacquer finish. Let's go back to again the journey of uh, crafting. Um, is there an aspect that you just on the flip side that you love the most? Yes, I, I love uh, starting and uh, designing guitars. I love the uh, creative aspects of some of the ornamentation in terms of uh, headstocks, rosettes, and graphs. And that's really not so much a um, kind of a mechanical process in terms of you know turning saws on and. Uh, chisel work and things, but there's a there's a good part that just happens on a piece of paper or in your own head, and I really enjoy that. And then bringing that uh, to my workbench and having a whole palette of different woods and materials to work with, and you know, trying to bring that uh, to fruition in a guitar. So I've always enjoyed that. It, it has evolved in terms of how I go about it, um, in in terms of even how I design stuff and my tastes have certainly changed over the years. And, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, I I really like uh, starting guitars because even as I'm building a guitar, um, I'm always excited to start the next one that I haven't started yet. Did you um, find that when you're doing the design, you have it, you have the vision in your head already and it's just a matter of putting it down or is there a lot of experimentation in terms of the, the pencil sketches and the, yeah. um, it's a bit of back and forth. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I just start, you know, noodling around on a piece of paper and then I'll just put it down for a while and then just kind of let it sort of ruminate in my, uh, in the old coconut. And uh, a lot of times I feel like if you're just, if I'm just sort of open to the world, you know, I could be listening to an interview and somebody mentions something and then all of a sudden that clicks off an idea. Like, for example, the other day I was listening to an interview and the, the artist had mentioned uh, cross hatching. And just by her saying that, you know, all of a sudden I started thinking, wow, you know, how can I? I've always liked cross hatching in terms of you know black and white drawings and even on some pearl inlays I've seen, and it just got me thinking about how I can start to put those into some of the things I put on my guitars. Yeah, beautiful pen and ink cross hatching. That's that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. Stippling as well, um, yeah. but you know it's it's almost getting into the engraving side of things, especially with the inlays. Yeah, that's great. So um, continuing on the the tone wood conversation um, and given your your vest uh, knowledge base. Uh, when you have individuals that 
you know, I mean, the conversation around woods in, 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 in itself can go on for quite a while. And, I, and what I love about having these conversations is there's no right or wrong. There's just a lot of different flavors. But do you find that your building in terms of how it's advanced, Michael, has trying to hone in on a particular type of sound or if a, if a, is it more of a, you know, a collaboration with the, the customer and they want to build out of a particular that they want a, a guitar made out of a particular type of wood. And then you know what you have to work with to get the sound that you're looking for out of it. Is there a favorite wood? I know there's a lot of questions in there, but yeah, yeah. general perspectives of tone woods in general. Well, um, to answer your, the first part of the question is it, it's usually more of a collaboration because even though, um, uh, I, well, I am a, a custom guitar builder and my goal is to fulfill, you know, what the customer expects and wants out of the guitar, uh, acoustically, visually, playability wise. And so I really listen to them in terms of, you know, what they want uh, for the guitar to sound like. And it's, it's not always a, a straightforward discussion because often when I'm talking with my customers, you know, we, we all have different languages and ways to describe sound and all of it is inexact and, um, and to a certain degree uh, falls sh short of the mark. Um, it's like describing, you know, flavors. Uh, you can only, it only goes so far. And so over the years, I've kind of learned to, you know, ask the right questions and talk to them about what kind of guitars they're playing, they're playing now or have played what they've liked and disliked. And then um, I really try and develop a common language with the customer. And based on that, you know, we start to actually, the, the first thing I actually like to choose is the model um, because it's the, the design of the guitar, the body that has a huge influence on the tone, right. you know, whether they, they want a, a small body, midsize or a larger body guitar. And then from that, you know, start to drill down into um, actually the top wood is the next thing that's selected um, and then, and then actually, lastly, it's the, uh, it's the tone wood, the back and side wood, and not to say that's, not, that's, you know, um, not as important. It is, it is very important, but, um, to me, the, the hierarchy would be the, you know, the model, the top, and then pairing it with the right tone wood to get the sound that the customer's after. Now, sometimes, uh, the sound that the customer is after is not the sound that necessarily I'm after if I'm just building a, a spec guitar for a show or, you know, for a dealer who gives me a lot of freedom. And, um, but, you know, that that's okay because everybody likes something different. And, you know, as long as it's something that I know that, you know, I'll, I'll be happy with and they'll be happy with and that's what matters. Right, exactly. So basically what you're saying is I shouldn't order one out of balsa wood. Uh, yes, I would not build you that one. So, well, I'm glad to hear you say that because we do want to make the customers happy, right? Mm -hmm. Customers always right, but we have to um, we have to at least advise. Um, yes, so. and there, there's a there's a lot of decisions that go into the tone wood because it's not just the sound; it's also uh, the looks, uh, the, the aesthetics of the tone woods are are huge on a guitar. You know, a straight grain mahogany piece versus a piece of uh, of um, uh, figured rosewood, uh, like Brazilian rosewood that has some inky lines in it and different colors, things like that. So, and and just our visual perception of the guitar also impacts how we experience it and how we even hear it, even though it's just a visual thing. Um, there's other things to consider, like the weight of the guitar, uh, for example. Uh, a player may want, they really like lightweight guitars, but they really want a rosewood type of sound. And so you have to choose the right rosewood that's maybe a medium density and do some things to make a lighter weight guitar um, uh, out of rosewood. And then, you know, final consideration uh, is cost because the cost can really vary. Going back to your comment about designing. Mm -hmm. If, if a, in, the, in your process, in terms of how you approach the, the, um, the entire build, one of my favorite parts of the process is sourcing the woods, is going around and finding the pieces in different parts of the country and the world. Mm -hmm. But when you're working with a customer and they say, to your point, you know, I, I want this look or this kind of type of sound, maybe it's an, an inky or a variety of different colors in the rosewood. Do you start 
the design process well after the, the wood has been selected? Because I would imagine that a lot of the textures and figure of the wood can inspire where you take the design. Yeah. Um, well, I don't really, you, you sort of answered the question in a way, other than I could just say yes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Once, once the uh, the tone wood is selected, then it definitely influences the design, uh, especially, you know, choosing other parts of the guitar, like the, the end graft and the binding and purfling. Um, is it going to potentially uh, clash or take away, uh, or, or is it going to be too busy? Like if you have a very highly figured back, for my preference, I don't like to put a highly figured binding with that it's it's like too much visual information i like to frame that in yeah. um, and give it some nice contrast to, to actually highlight the figure in the back rather than compete with it the guitar leaves your possession you you've spent so much time 18 you know 12 18 months with this instrument you're now imparting it onto the customer you have a standard you know do's and don'ts that you talk to them about how do you how do you approach the uh, here's your instructions once it's left my hands yeah, uh, there's definitely some care and feeding instructions that are really important and often uh, depending on, you know, the customer and what guitars they've owned or, um, or currently have, you know, I kind of get a sense of whether they uh, need some guidance or, you know, they may already tell me, yes, I keep all my guitars in, uh, you know, a humidity controlled room and, you know, sometimes they leave leave that room and or sometimes they don't um but probably you know the most important thing would be uh certainly humidity um and and you know followed by temperature but basically if if you're comfortable then in general the guitar is going to be comfortable as well we don't or at least i don't like to be in 95 uh, percent humidity or you know 10 percent humidity and uh and i don't like to be in 115 degree temperature or, uh, or minus 20. So it's always good to um, think about if you're comfortable, then the guitar is going to be comfortable as well. And you want to avoid extremes and you want to avoid sudden changes um, in either humidity or temperature. So those are those are the basics. There's certainly some other things that that go along with it. But in terms of acoustic guitars, those are probably the big ones that uh, concern me and that I want to make sure the customer is aware about. I love how you play, place that or, or, you know, the way you expressed. If you're comfortable, the guitar is generally going to be comfortable. That's that's wonderful. I've never heard that before. Uh, I have heard the extremes, you know, the car, mm -hmm. leave it in the car, not in the attic. Um, um, and, the, and the extreme changes, you know, the degree of change, the rapidness of change of temperature and humidity. Uh, yeah. So now, um, I, I would point out that at least in Colorado, uh, leaving the guitar in a car is a really bad idea. We, uh, the sun is so strong here that the temperature inside a car can get above 115 degrees very quickly. Yeah. And I've definitely seen some damages. Uh, a lot of the repairs I've done over the year are, are joints moving under heat stress. I have not been to Fort Collins, um, been to Denver a bunch, been to Boulder a bunch. Um, but I have to imagine, given the, the geography, that you can look out your window and see the beginning of the Rockies there, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, just, just to be realistic about it, at least where my shop is, I can also look out my shop door and, and, uh, and see Walmart. So I, <laughs> I, I kind of get a bit of both. So there you go. You got, you got your balance, right? Yeah. What would your guidance be or, or words of wisdom or advice to people that are saying, hey, I think I might want to give this a shot? Yeah, well, nowadays, there's a lot of great options in terms of different ways to get going. There's some great schools like the uh, Brian Gallup School of, of uh, Guitar Building in Michigan, the Roberto Venn School. Uh, there's Red Wing in Minnesota. Um, there's also a lot of uh, builders doing individual courses, um, both uh, you know week long or longer. So um, there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You know, all of those involve time and money for sure. Um, if you are are short on on both or, or one of them, uh, then there's a lot of just great information on books and videos. Uh, there is good information on the internet. Um, uh, there's some bad information too, but you know it's uh, if what? 
Yes, seriously. I know this is shocking, but uh, um, but I, I, actually, I think in general, um, the information is good because typically, if you're researching something or looking for a way to do things, you know, you're not just going to watch, or you probably you're not just going to watch one video, but you'll watch several videos and you know get get different perspectives and different ways to do it. Um, so. There, uh, so yeah, if somebody you know wants to start to dip their toe into Lu3, um, if if they have the the resources, then I think the best thing to do is to try and go uh, study uh, with the best uh, guitar builder or repair person you can. Um, often they require some experience first, like going to one of the schools that I mentioned. Um, if if that's not a possibility, and it's certainly not for a lot of people, then you know just. Uh, um, opening books and watching videos and um, buying a few tools and dive in. Jump into the deep end. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's better to swim with somebody. What's the worst that could happen? You know, <laughs> Where would you say would be the biggest, um, you know, give yourself a pat on the back here, what, biggest advancement in terms of your design or approach in, in, in building your guitars? Hmm. Uh, it's a little bit of a tough question because I feel like it's, there's been a constant evolution on all fronts. Uh, I, I'm certainly a better guitar builder than I was, you know, 20 years ago, and I'm a better guitar builder than I was, you know, five years ago. And, uh, I, and it, I kind of try and are constantly try and move the ball on every single aspect of it, whether it's design, um, just the process of building. Um, the tone, I think, you know, my, uh, I've become a little bit, certainly my taste has changed over time in terms of how I listen to guitars and what I want to hear out of a guitar. Um, so those are all things that I strive for. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I, I, I guess if you want me to single out one thing, I'm, I, I had no woodworking experience when I started building guitars. And so probably the thing that I've improved the most on uh, has just been the, the craftsmanship aspect of it. And, you know, I still have a ways to go. It's a lifelong, lifelong journey. Well, as long as we're, you're enjoying it and, you know, are passionate about it, then that should be easy part. Yep. It helps. It helps to love it for sure. It certainly does help to love it. Michael, um, going back real quick on the tone woods, um, is there a favorite for you? Uh, just let's talk tops, for example, a particular sound out of the a particular species of, of soundboards that you prefer? Yeah, um, I'm particularly partial to the lower density spruces like uh, Italian spruce or Swiss spruce. Uh, in general, I'm building finger style guitars that I want a very fast attack and a lot of response up front. And um, I find that the, uh, the lighter weight spruces do that. Um, so those are my favorites. And in terms of back and side woods, um, that's a little bit of a tougher question. I'm, I'm definitely a sucker for the traditional tone woods, uh, rosewood mahoganies, especially you know, when they're um, uh, dead on quarter and straight grained. And I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'd rather, for me personally, I'd rather see a very straight grain piece with no figure than something that's highly figured with the, the grain going all over the place. I know that, you know, there's a certain uh, visual um, excitement or kind of eye candy or wow factor uh, when you get a really highly figured piece of wood. Um, and it's definitely there, but I don't know that, I don't think those woods uh, particularly necessarily sound any better. I, I have not met anybody that can, you know, close their eyes and hear the difference between a highly figured koa and, uh, you know, a straight green rosewood. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if yeah. every, everything else being equal, um, I, I mean, I'd be hard, I, I know I would be hard pressed to hear it. Although the highly figured koas are glimmery, but they also break on your bending iron very easily. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful, for sure, for sure. Oh yeah, okay. Well, Michael, that's all I had in terms of just our, our, our quick little chat. Um, okay. I enjoyed it. I hope you did. Um, yeah. So, perfect. Okay, great. All right, Michael. Thanks so much. Talk all right, soon. take care. Bye-bye. To learn more about Michael Bashkin, his wonderful Luthier on Luthier podcast, 
or to inquire about a custom-made Bashkin guitar, visit BashkinGuitars.com or click on the link right below this video. Thank you for joining us on Builder Spotlight. Be sure to sign up at Acoustic.Coffee and we'll send you a notice when the next episode's ready. Until then, happy brewing, happy building, happy strumming.